Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench we have a BK Precision 100 megahertz frequency counter. Model number is 1803C. Uh, this counter was featured in a previous video where we redid the power supply and got it up and running again. And it spent some time on my 7603. It got usurped by the 5704 because I had much uh, more gate options on the 5704 than on the BK Precision. However, I'd like to get this in the lab and uh, get this spun up for some other purposes that would be, need to be less accurate. The 5704 is on the GPSDO, not on the Rubidium, but the um, the time base in this is is pretty bad. So it's got the original crystal stabilized time base. At least it's a crystal. I have some other gear in the lab that doesn't even have a crystal stabilized time basis, which is uh, even less stable. And they need adjustment more often. So in this, what I want to do is we got a plug pack hooked up to this one. Um, in a previous video, part of the issues was the power supply and when I got it, the lack of plug pack. However, it does not have a 10 megahertz reference. So what we're going to do today is we're going to reverse engineer the time base section, pop in a 10 megahertz reference, see if we can't make this thing tick off of the rubidium. That's at least the plan. So we'll need to add at least two holes to the back of this. So one will be for a, a switch so I can flip it between internal and external. The other one will be for the B and C jack for the, for the signal input. First up, let's get it in. Let's start reverse engineering the time base section and we'll see exactly what we find. Okay, here we are on the bottom of the unit. Four screws and the bottom pops off. These are tapped into threaded inserts, so they are machine screws. They're not just plastic tappers, which is nice. Makes getting into these things easier and easier for repair. The uh, Come on. My hands will work correctly. The time base in here, I'm not sure what the base frequency is. If it's 10 megahertz, great. If it's not 10 megahertz, we may have to do some multiplication or division to get 10 megahertz down to, say, 5, 1. The, the common time bases are 1, 5, and 10. So we have our plug pack coming in. Display on the front. Input section and the rest of the board. Um, while we're in here, I might test some of these electrolytic capacitors. We may give this a capacitor refresh just to make it live for a while. So to get the board out, we have metal nuts threaded onto plastic risers, three of them here, here, and here. Uh, the front panel is hooked on by the B and C jack, so that'll come with it. The back panel flops around. I believe, no, I have not changed that capacitor yet. I haven't changed that cap at all. So we'll definitely change the bulk electrolytic on here, stabilize the power supply. Actually, we'll give it a good recap while we're at it. Won't be a problem. Won't burn too many parts. Nothing jumps out. So our time-based section, let me get a pointer. Our time-based section is right here. Here's our crystal. Points of the circuit and interest are going to be probably this IC. I don't know yet because I haven't looked. But definitely here's the crystal to stabilize, and this would be the tuning capacitor for keeping the crystal stable. Now, it also looks like we have two ceramic disc capacitors very close to the crystal. And these do not look like... They don't have the black band on top, but they are both marked C0. So C0G caps, if they weren't... I'm out of frame. If these weren't C0G caps, they would not be stable. As this warmed up and cooled down, the, uh, the time base would drag all over the place. They are labeled. So they are labeled C0. And it's not printed very well, but this one in the back was labeled C0 as well. So they're fine for a oscillator section. So what I'm guessing is this is a CD74HCT Zero, zero. A chip that is normally used here is an inverter. However, this is not an inverter. 
I do believe this is a quad NAND gate. So what we're probably going to find is the crystal is tied to one of the inputs. And what this is going to do is this is going to sharpen up the pseudo sine wave that's going to come out of the crystal. It's going to sharpen it up to a square wave for the rest of the circuits. And that's going to be the master clock. One of the ways they'll do this, or one of the ways this can be done, is one of the rails will be just tied high, and the other one will get the signal, and it'll just cause the uh, chip to bounce. Uh, a better way to do this with more modern components, now that we have them, would be a Schmidt triggered inverter. Um, because it's Schmidt triggered, you won't have pseudo triggering, it'll cut down the jitter quite a bit, but then it'll clock very well, and it's an inverter. What you can do is you can if you have like a hex inverter to get more drives drive out of it, you can take one of the inverters, use it as the trigger for the crystal, and then take that inverter, drive the other five to get the current out of the out of the IC. So you can have one that's sharpening up the sine wave into a square wave, but then you can have five of them working in tandem for drive to the to the line. Works really well if edges are uh, depending on how critical the um, edge lineup is because that can fuzz out the uh, transition just a little bit because you have five inverters acting as one and they're not perfectly in sync. A bunch of weird stuff with timing can be done. So for right now, let's go ahead and power the, uh, well, let's get the board off, take a look at the bottom. And uh, we'll also verify that this is what I think it is. Look up a data sheet and I will be right back. If this is the case, all we're going to have to do is break into this chip and feed it our 10 megahertz from the external reference. So should be a kind of easy modification to get some more stability out of this B and K. Okay, to get the board out, it is a, what is this size? Uh, three eighths. And these will thread off these plastic posts. Maybe. Hmm, that one doesn't want to come out. I had to argue with that one. Okay, this board should just lift out now, and it does. Oh, a little bit of shielding tape. Looks like we have probably a spring interface at the bottom. Yep, this spring is grounding that out to the board to give us some shielding over the front end. Okay, let's take a look at these capacitors first. Caps on. Three point three microfarads at fifty volt. And We have a 47 by 10, 47 by 10, and a 3.3 by 50. That's a, given that this runs on an 8 volt plug pack, that's a weird, or a, I mean the bulk caps lessons is 16 volts, so having 50 volt caps in here is kind of weird. We can definitely drop these down to 25s, that's not going to hurt anything. Uh, so we'll get those popped out and then we'll do some reverse engineering. Well, with all the caps that I have in the lab, I might have a problem. All I can, all I have on the shelf is uh, 2200 by 50, which I am reasonably sure is not going to fit inside this case at all. It will clear by an eighth of an inch. 
except the standoffs are going to make it too high. It won't close. So that's not going to work. Wow, I have a ton of capacitors in stock in the lab, and all of them are a bad fit for this unit. Which doesn't typically happen, just means I'll have to order some more. Uh, the only 3.3 volts I had were 400 volts. So that's obviously not going to work. I have been told many times in the comments that everyone would like to see more of the process. So here we go. Nope. So part of this is the solder, the heat makes it up through the plated through hole to the top side of the component, which allows me to clear the hole. But if I don't leave the solder gun on there long enough, I don't get the heat transfer I need to completely clear the hole. Which is kind of what's going on there, but... All right. And it looks like our negative side is towards the back of the board. That's not good. Okay, there we go. Cleared the hole, but I felt the solder blob fall, so we have to clear this off. The solder blob ended up right next to the voltage regulator, so I do not want anything to short out when I power this thing back up. There we go. Okay. Even though the capacitor symbol on the board is a unpolarized capacitor, these were electrolytics, they are polarized. If you put them in backwards, they will get excited in a bad way. To make sure you get a good solder joint, a little bit of solder on the iron. That helps with heat transfer. And then touch the pad and the leg, come in from the other side, let everything get wet. And don't uh, work fast so you don't lift a pad, but let it uh, make sure you get enough heat. This one's taking a little bit longer because it's a bigger ground plane. But make sure you get enough heat to wick the joint. And that's it. Another... Another interesting thing on this side, the silk screen is labeled positive. We don't have that. We do have that up here, actually. It's just off, off to the side. So we do have a polarity marking on the silk screen, even though the capacitor symbol is unpolarized. Well, that helps. Pictures also help. If, uh, if you're taking a lot of stuff apart, pictures and self-drawn diagrams are always a good idea to help get everything put back together where it goes problem with repair sometimes is you have one shot once you turn the power on bad things can happen and if things are wired wrong and backwards really bad things can happen the other problem with really bad things happening is they can be an absolute nightmare to fix I do apologize if the board is slightly out of frame while I'm doing this. I am paying attention to where the hot iron is going, not necessarily where the camera is pointed. 
because I've done it once or twice. Soldering iron burns hurt a lot. I'm also being very careful not to crack the front plastic while I'm moving the board around because it is still affixed to the front. Should have waited for the beep on that one. Last of the tiny caps. Okay, we're going to do a quick power up on the board. If anything, well, if I put anything in backwards, we'll get smoke. Doesn't look bad. We have some counting. That's fine. That's just noise that's open. I'm not expecting valid data at this point. Let this run for a bit. I am going to order a bulk cap for back here. Now, again, this is 8 volts. So nothing too crazy here with some of the stuff we work on. Putting fingers in the device when it's on is a bad day. Um, scopes and tube gear have extremely elevated voltages in them, and if you're not careful, they can jump out and bite you. Something that I have had happen personally. Now the caps were replaced. Value wasn't critical. Upping the value to 10 microfarads isn't going to hurt the device at all. Um, the 3.3s were probably cheap. Um, but having the 10 microfarads around will quiet the power rails down and get us going in the future. So let's take a look at the scope. And while we have it running, we'll see about this clock. Yeah, I think running without the Graticule lights will look good. So scope ground lead, kind of important. One of the weird things with this is... I don't have a grounded connection, so this device is actually floating through that plug pack. That plug pack's only a two-wire plug pack, and we're on the battery mode, so we're not hooked up to earth ground at all. So if I get this wrong, we can get some weird readings on the scope, which I'll show you. We'll just clip to this resist or this uh, switch right here, resistor. Wow. We'll clip to this switch, some metal, and we'll probe... Uh, this capacitor right here, which should be my, um, which should be my crystal signal. And let's see, what do we got? Well, that's weird. So we got a whole bunch of, we're triggered, everything's good. But the scope looks very strange for what I'd be expecting there. I'd be expecting something signed wavish. So let's unclip this real quick and notice the signal didn't change at all. So that means we, we are not on a ground plane for this particular board. So let's try this shielding. And I'll just hook the scope probe up. Much better. So now we have a the scope ground reference. Now why that was happening was because I have a board that's floating 
and I have a scope that's grounded. So what was ending up happening is it was picking up all the noise in the lab and showing it to me because the scope's measuring off of ground reference and this doesn't have a ground reference. Now it does, right here. So, uh, let's give it some signal. And without looking, Nine 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 one six, and that's in kilohertz. So we have nine point nine 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 six two kilohertz. So we're at nine, just shy of ten megahertz. So we do have a ten megahertz clock, which means this modification is going to be relatively simple. Let's check. The data, uh, I'm going to check this data sheet on a CD74 HTC, HCT00E and confirm that is what I think it is. And we'll also look at the bottom of this board and see if the crystal even goes into this chip. I, I'm, I'm guessing it does because it's so close by. Okay, here we are on the bottom of the board, and I think we're going to be all right because my crystal is here, these two pads. Here's our tuning capacitor, so it's easy to find. However, if we look at the output of the tuning capacitor and the crystal, so this would be the tuned side, this would be the input side, we come right down here into pin 2 of that IC. Here's those three resistors, and here's that IC. So let's check the data sheet and see what kind of signals we have. Okay, I have checked the data sheet and I have confirmed that we do have a quad input NAND gate. Now, for this to function correctly in circuit, I expect one of these pins is going to be tied high and the other one's going to have signal and on the output, conveniently it's pin 1, 2, and 3, and the output we're going to have Um, our waveform. So I've got the scope set in uh, AC mode. That's not going to work for this measurement, so let's kick it over to DC. And we are at 1 volt per division. We're going to go up to 2 volts per division to make this a little easier to see. Now, if this is done the way I think it is, I'm going to touch pin 1, and we're either going to get signal or we're going to get a DC offset. If we get a DC offset, it's going to jump up probably around 5 volts. So we're probably going to have the scope trace jump up to about here on the screen. And uh, that'll tell us if so. If it does jump up like that, that'll tell us the signals on pin 2 and the output's going to be on pin 3. So we're going to check pin 1. And right there, 5 volts. So we jumped up two and a half divisions, so that pin is tied high. Pin two then should have our clock. I see signal. Now we are DC offset a little bit because our ground reference is set here and I still have the scope in DC mode. Should tell me uh, no. Um, okay, why do I not have... Huh, why is my... Oh, there it goes. Okay, so counter. Let me move up. Counter is counting, again. So, and we have signal. So, we are good at 10 megahertz. So, so let's check the output now. So if I flip this over to DC, we should still have counting too. Let's check. Yeah, we're good. So what does our clock look like for the rest of the unit? Oh, somewhat ugly, but it's an, I mean, edge triggering will do it. It's a clock and we're 
edge triggering now very nicely at 10 megahertz. So that gave it an edge a little bit. So the little bit of wiggles are me moving the probe a little bit. Uh, my hands aren't 100% steady. So this is good. So we know this NAND gate, one of its functions is it's taking that clock and it is sending it out to the rest of the frequency counter. So where do we want to intercept the signal and tap into the circuit? We want to do it at pin 2. All right, I've got our pin 2 lifted off of the clock signal. So now I need to tap into the crystal, and I need to also tap into an external reference and put a switch in. So the next thing I have to do is I have to poke at least one or two holes into this backplate, probably two, because what I think I'm going to do is I think I'm going to put one down here. I think I'm going to put a hole down here for the power cord because I don't like the way this is set up and I'm going to put a grommet in and then I'm going to put a hopefully I think a B and C will fit here and then I'll put another hole for the switch but I want to do this on the drill press so it's nice and solid because this is a phenolic and I do not want to crack this by drilling too aggressively into it so okay here's our back panel we have a grommet we have a grommet now for the front end, or for the power supply, sorry. Uh, we have a B and C jack for the external reference, and we have a switch that we're going to hook the external reference, or we're going to hook uh, pin two of our quad NAND gate to the center pin, so we'll be able to switch between the outer two pins, which will be the internal clock and the external clock. So we'll get this wired up here real quick. But this is all we're doing. I have a bit of coax that we're going to use to wire some things up. And I think I'm going to throw it back in the case because we can do everything at this point from the top side of the board. Pop this back in here and go from there. And we'll put a zip strip on here just to have some strain relief so the power cord doesn't get yanked out. Uh, if I turn the unit on right now, nothing's going to happen because it has no internal clock and it's not going to get any gating and it's going to be completely out to lunch. So we're going to finish wiring this up and then we'll fire it up. Okay, I have the switch put in and some coax cables running into the appropriate points in the circuit. I did try to solder to the capacitor, but it was a little tight, so I had to use the pad underneath where we vacated the pin. So we have the internal clock coming in up top, the router coming down to the IC, the external clock coming in, and then all the grounds are tied together here. And then they are, this white wire comes over to a ground plane on the back of the shield. Uh, it is grounded to the board, not the shield itself, so we should be good there. So everything is now ground referenced, at least for this particular unit. So Let's turn it on. Uh, I have the switch in the up position, which is the external clock, so I'm not expecting any, um, we'll zoom back out, I'm not expecting any counting to happen. Should be out to lunch, which it is, but if I flip this, we have counting. Now, let's feed this some signal. I have a one volt peak to peak of one kilohertz out of the function generator. And we'll just turn on the output. And one kilohertz, nice. So what we can do to test this is I will use channel two of the function generator. Uh, home, channel two is going to be all right to set up channel 2 we have channel 2 of the function generator set to 5 volts peak to peak into high z which is true because we're going into the front side of a chip and uh, frequency of 10 megahertz so this will be a nice clock so if i switch over to so i'll pardon all the camera movements trying to get what's going on behind the scenes on the bench so if i kick this over we lose gating and everything, so that's expected. However, if I turn on channel 2, we're back to 1 kilohertz. Now, that 
craziness in the beginning is just stability. Who knows where the chips are when the count comes in. Uh, let's go to... Uh, scope probe this, actually. We'll have some fun. All right, so we'll take a look at the scope here in a second. I've got the probe hooked up. And we have, out of the function generator, 20 megahertz. Let's make this, let's have some fun. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine kilohertz. Okay. Oh, that was a little too fast. Turn off the low pass filter. And we're at 9.99999, and I'm at 10 megahertz. Or I'm at 100 megahertz. So we will go to, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six hertz. See if we can add a couple digits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A little too high. It's off by a hertz. It's bouncing a little bit, but the case is also open too. Not that the plastic's going to do much shielding. And we'll gate this down a little bit. One, two, three, four, five, six. This should be seven, eight, but it's doing all right. We'll switch this back to its internal clock. And we're down at uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 4, 3. So the internal clock's a little bit off. So definitely worth doing the upgrade. Back to the external clock. So definitely increase the accuracy of this frequency counter. This modification is going to be done for now. So I'm going to put everything back together. Oh, yeah, we were going to look at the scope. Okay, I'm on the uh, oscilloscope with the frequency counter in the for in the foreground or not the foreground in frequency counter in shot so we'll dial up some brightness and we have our 10 megahertz sine wave coming in kick this over to the internal oscillator 9998 now we can adjust that a little bit and the adding that cable capacitance doesn't shock me that it drug that around a bit so let's see if we can't tune this up Okay, we're going to tweak this tuning capacitor before we close everything back up. Now this is not That's better. It was very much not stable. Looks like 9995 is going to be about the best we can get on the internal. So, it's still pretty good. Um It is not terrible, but if we switch back to the external, it just it just locks in and stays there. So not the most stable time base on the planet. So setting the function generator back to 10 megahertz. Now this is also on the rubidium as it's as the function generator's time base. So I believe the rubidium versus the internal of the B and K. Uh, low pass filters back on in a 0.1 second. So it's um, 10.19 or 10.0019 
is the closest I can get. So it's off by about 190 hertz on the internal counting. However, if I flip it over, so if I go to one second and we expand out the time base, you'll see 183. So that's the closest I can get. Uh, to tune that up, I would need to change out the variable capacitor or one of these other two capacitors that's dragging the crystal around. Uh, I'm going to look for a little bit wider range capacitor to put in there. However, what really makes this worth doing is if I kick this into the external time base, locked in dead solid. So I will take that all day long. Just know that if you do this modification to any frequency counter, these crystals are incredibly sensitive to capacitive loading. And just this chunk of coax is enough to have to change out a couple of components to get the dial to come back to center. So, but for now, that's what we're going we're gonna to run with. And we're going to get this put back up on the bench and run from there. Hope everybody enjoyed the video. I will see everybody in the comments in between videos. And I will catch you guys on the next one.